Good evening. My name is Katie McKee and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture here at the University of Mississippi. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 14th annual Gilder Jordan Lecture in Southern Cultural History. Organized through the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, the African American Studies Program, the Center for Civil War Research, and the Department of History. The Gilder Jordan Speaker Series is made possible through the generosity of the Gilder Foundation Incorporated. The series honors the late Richard Gilder of New York and his family, as well as, as University of Mississippi alumni, Dan and Lou Jordan of Virginia. We are so grateful that the Gilder Jordan Lecture provides us the opportunity to host on our campus acclaimed historians from across the nation who engage in myriad ways the complexity of our common past and its relevance to our present moment. Tonight's lecturer is no exception to the remarkable string of speakers who have graced this stage. And so to introduce her properly, here is Professor Derek Harrell, UM Director of African American Studies and Otilly Schilling, Associate Professor of English, African American Studies, and Creative Writing. I'm Derek Harrell, uh, as Katie mentioned, and I'm happy to be here uh, and excited to be here tonight to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Kadada Williams, a uh, historian and writer who studies African-American victims of racist violence. Uh, Dr. Williams is the author of I Saw It Coming, which just last week I saw was uh, long listed for the National Book Award, so let's give a hand for that. <laughs> That's huge. And they left great marks on me. Uh, Dr. Williams is co-editor of Charleston Syllabus, host and co-producer of Seizing Freedom, a, post, a podcast docudrama that covered the epic story of African Americans' fight for freedom during the Civil War era. Uh, lastly, uh, Dr. Williams is a professor of history at Wayne State University in Detroit. Please help me welcome uh, Dr. Kadada Williams. Hey, good evening. good evening. And thank you so much for coming out. Um, it's such an honor to be here in your gorgeous city, on your absolutely beautiful campus. I'm so jealous. Um, with your wonderful faculty, staff, and students. It's a pleasure to be here giving this uh, Gilder Jordan lecture. I want to thank the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, uh, the Department of History, the African American Studies Program, the Center for Civil War Research, and the Gilder Foundation for its support for Southern history. But I also want to give special thanks to Afton for inviting me and handling so many of the logistics, the students for their wonderful questions um, and brilliant potential, and for the faculty who joined me at meals, and for Ralph and Noel getting me from and to Memphis. So we're going to get started. Abe and Eliza Lyon were lined up on the starting blocks of freedom when slavery was abolished. Having dreamed of this moment for most of their remembered lives, they sprinted to fulfill their visions of family, self-determination, and prosperity. By 1870, the family had accomplished a great deal. Abe Lyon was 30 years old, as you can see here. Eliza was 35. They got legally married and set up their home in a little village in Choctaw County, Alabama. Abe was working as a blacksmith from his own shop. Eliza left her job in domestic service. And she was keeping her own house, only occasionally doing some work on the plantation, but only just to make a little bit of extra money. They had amassed a horde of hogs, a significant investment that indicates they were producing cured meats for the market and breeding specifically to sort of like um, participate in the market economy. Their three children, William, Ella, and Annie, were all enrolled in a local school. An older daughter was attending school in Demopolis. Through their combined industry, Abe and Eliza had saved $600, the relative worth of which is more than $200,000 today. They planned to move to Demopolis, buy property, 
and build a home of their own. Secession and the founding of the Confederacy were less than a decade in the past. Barely five years separated the family from the end of the bloody Civil War and their initial sprint to fulfill their visions of a free black future. They were living their best post-emancipation life. And I think that's important to acknowledge because their testimonies and all of these other records make clear that they had made the most of freedom. And those achievements provide context for why Confederates targeted them in what I call the war after the Civil War, the one white Southern extremists waged on African Americans' freedom. Like many Americans, when I was in school, I was either not taught anything about Reconstruction or I was taught that it failed. What no one said outright, at least not in polite company, was that black people were freed from slavery, given every possible chance to succeed, rights in the vote, and they failed to make the most of it. Again, that's not what people say, but that's what the failure narrative meant in the minds of the, lo of the lost cause enthusiasts who initially promoted it. And trust me, the way anti-blackness permeates our society, that's what people hear when they hear the language of people using um, the sort of people use the language of Reconstruction failing. That tale of black people not making the most of freedom never made sense to me. But that's what my teacher said, who was out of question it. So I moved on to research other more worthy topics because who studies a failure, right? But something kept drawing me to Reconstruction. And the more I researched the records of the era, the more I recognized what a truly transformative moment this was. There were so many revolutionary developments, abolition, the opening of schools, hundreds of independent churches, a boom in black land ownership and entrepreneurship, national citizenship rights and protections, voting rights for black men and black office holding that the historian Eric Foner has called it the second founding after the American Revolution. Professional historians know who failed to make good on the promises of American freedom. They know that the people who failed were federal officials and the white majority who elected them. But they don't always say that when they talk about Reconstruction failing. So the larger public doesn't get it. That's why this narrative of Reconstruction just failing continues to circulate and be taught in schools. Families like Abe and Eliza Lyons's were part of this transformative moment. They had joined more than four million other black people who helped snatch freedom from Confederates and who tried to live upright and build a morally just world for their families after the Civil War. And what the historical records, testimonies, reports, WPA interviews, folklore, art, correspondence, speeches, newspapers, savings account deposits, census records, marriage certificates, voting logs, and good faith interpretations of them reveal is that by 1870, a lot of black Southerners had picked themselves up from slavery. They had reassembled their families to the best of their ability. They worked harder for themselves than they did for the people who held them in bondage. They established their communities with churches, schools, orphanages, newspapers, mutual aid societies, and more. Some had acquired land and opened their own businesses like Abe Lyons did. Others were working, being industrious, saving money with their eyes fixed on the prize of having their own homesteads. And to protect all these rights and to secure their families' futures, black men wanted to vote and serve in office. So we see even the visual culture of this period can reflect all of the things that African Americans achieve um, in their initial sprint into freedom. Marriages, churches, schools, the like. Pent up energy to seize their freedom. Voting, serving on juries, etc. Some Confederates who hadn't really given up the cause of subjugating and exploiting black people saw all of these strides as a threat to their ongoing mastery. And so what we see them do is fight to sustain their privileges in the American system. Rights, like the Reconstruction Acts and Amendments, 
weren't self-executing. They depended on human and institutional support to help enforce them and sustain them. And for the most part, rights ensuring black people's protections in the body politic didn't have that support. And Confederates knew it. That's why they launched a torrent of attacks on black people who were reaping the rewards of Reconstruction's expansion of freedom and democracy. When recalling Klan violence to WPA interviewers in the 1930s, Isaac Steer, who lived between Hamburg and Union Church, Mississippi, described what happened as the devil being turned loose. In the spring of 1866, white men in Pulaski, Tennessee formed social clubs in which they sometimes donned masks or elaborate costumes, played pranks, and even performed musical entertainment. The white men called themselves Ku Klux after the Greek word circle. And what we see is that very quickly, Klansmen, Klansmen's activities spread across the South and evolved into roaming armed through communities in the middle of the night, conducting paramilitary attacks on black and white, progressive white families. And extremists and their apologists often refer to these raids euphemistically as visits, masking their brutality behind the veneer of a friendly social call. Klansman's work gave rise to this uh, pretty widespread extremist movement. And it, became, it gets so big that any white man or group of white men who wanted to intimidate or kill their targets might be associated with it, whether they were actually involved with a Klan or another white terror group or not. And as more white Southern men mustered into this growing shadow army's ranks and started experimenting with their acts of terror, they grew more deadly. And so Klan violence is part of what I call the white Southern war on freedom. Now, it might seem odd to liken what we've been taught was the peace after the Civil War to war. But wars never end as nearly as they appear to in history books. They're often followed by new conflicts. And the new conflict after the Civil War was some white Southern conservatives fight to undercut black people's freedom and the, the sort of larger investment in the establishment of a more egalitarian democracy. One observer noted that some Confederates were, quote, lip loyal meaning they said one thing to federal officials and the larger American public, but they did another when it came to dominating all aspects of black people's lives, just as they had during slavery. But one thing is different in this moment. Many Confederates tried to slaughter those who resisted. And so there was no peace, as the historian George Rabel put it, especially not for many black people trying to live freely in the South. And African Americans like Abe and Eliza Lyon knew it. White extremists targeted black people who seized their freedom with shocking impunity. Black Mississippian William Coleman described death squads he saw raiding black settlements near Louisville as coming riding in great droves like they were going to the army to fight. Army and Freedmen's Bureau records are full of reports and many of the observers at the time used the words terror and terrorism to describe what they see happening. White extremists stole black children from their kin under the guise of apprenticeships. They shot down black male voters at the polls. They stalked black office holders and offered them bribes to leave office and often assassinated them or tried to assassinate them when that didn't work. They kidnapped black men and women at gunpoint and disappeared them disposing of their bodies in waterways, in woods, or even just along the roads. And as you see here, they often ambushed African-American families with nighttime raids, which are more like armed domestic uh, home invasions today. And during these visits, white men holding black families hostage subjected them to humiliation, rape, torture, and murder. And what we know is that during this period, there are also countless massacres and other mass killing events as extremists overthrow Reconstruction. Black people resisted this violence to be sure, but they do it in ways that make sense to them in the moment. Some hid or fled, which are natural human responses to someone trying to come and kill you. 
Others bore arms, defended their homes, injuring or killing their attackers if they could. But raids often last for so long that what we see is that captive families' agency goes back and forth on a pivot from one moment to the next. Resistance to acceptance, resistance to trying to placate their attackers, etc. White extremist violence was so widespread that black Southerners often found themselves outgunned and outmanned. Thousands of black men, women, and children were injured and killed during these attacks. And yes, there were some federal troops stationed throughout the region, and we can talk about where they were and what that meant. Uh, and there were some blacks and whites working together, but not nearly enough to quell the slaughter. A refrain in records from even Army personnel and federal officials was that there are too many killings to count, to say nothing of all the terrorized survivors and witnesses. And that's part of the reason why I think this narrative of Reconstruction failing is so problematic. Reconstruction didn't just fail, it didn't just fall apart. White Southern extremists overthrew it and the rest of the nation essentially let them. And so I Saw Death Coming tells that story. It follows black Southern families on their journeys out of slavery through their experiences of the war extremists waged on their freedom to their testimonies before Congress and beyond. It shows how black people understood and articulated the human costs of Reconstruction's violent overthrow and callous abandonment. And it does that through the stories of families like Abe and Eliza Lyons. On June 6, 1871, Abe had spent the day in his blacksmithing shop and Eliza finished her homemaking tasks. The children completed their chores and lessons with time for play after. They were all in bed at home at 11 p.m. when someone knocked on their door and asked if Abe was home. The family had never heard of any threats and were not thinking about such a thing, Eliza later said. That's why Abe answered that he was home and he got up from the bed to open the door. But something, perhaps the sight or sound of the visitors and his awareness of a potential threat that they might pose, or just a feeling, his skin tightening and puckering with goosebumps, whatever it was, we don't know. But it scared him, and it terrified him so much that he couldn't move. And what we know today is that human bodies and minds are wired to sustain themselves, and when under attack, focus solely on survival and avoiding injury. When the mind detects a threat to life, like Abe experienced, it triggers these pre-programmed pre um, escape plans by secreting stress chemicals to propel the body into action, specifically to run, hide, or fight. But for some people, especially those who may have had a prior significant trauma, the unthinkable happens. Their brain's defense circuitry shuts down and they freeze. Abe might have felt heavy as though he were in a nightmare from which he would soon awaken, but this wasn't a dream and that terrified him. Eliza, who remained calm, said Abe looked, quote, like he was in a perfect scare, like his feet were bolted to the floor, suggesting he was completely paralyzed by fear. And Abe remained in that trance-like state, prompting Eliza to do what she could to try to guide her husband to safety and protect herself and their three children. Eliza grabbed Abe, trying to steer him out the back door. And what she says is that he was so scared. He wheeled around the room in a scare, not knowing what to do, not being able to come out of that trance-like state. Eliza's hope that her husband would regain control of his senses was soon dashed. The invaders burst in, threw a rope over his head, and dragged him outside and away from their home. Eliza yelled to her neighbors or any passersby for help, but no one came. And she was very clear in her testimony that her neighbors were close enough to hear that they were under attack, but no one came to help them. To silence Eliza's screams, the attackers drew their guns on her. They told me if I didn't hush hollering, they would blow a hole right through me, she said. Eliza knocked away one of the guns with her hands. The men held fire, but she said they told her they would finish with me directly. The night Riders carried Abe away from his home and up the hill nearby. Eliza 
didn't follow, couldn't follow. Soon she saw the flash and heard the blast of a double barrel shotgun. Then one of the men ordered, uh, shouted an order to fight, or excuse me, uh, ordered the rest of the men to fire, and they did. After the terrorists killed Abe, Eliza spotted what she said were about 75 men returning to her house. I knew they were going to kill me, she said. Eliza ran inside to gather her children to flee, but her son William had disappeared. Unbeknownst to her, he had gone to the neighbors to try to get help. Moving with her daughters by her side, Eliza snuck out back to a field neighbor in her home. They stopped at a thicket of woods, trying to monitor their men's activities and take stock. Eliza couldn't go anywhere without knowing exactly where William was. But staying where she was put her girls and her in danger of being discovered. Eliza and the girls watched from the woods as the white men made up a light and began searching and ransacking their home. They tore up everything, she said. Wearing only their night clothes, Eliza and the girls moved farther into the woods as the night riders shot up their home. It sounded like there was over a hundred shots at once, she said. She and the girls remained hidden until the sun rise, until the sun rose, and when she could see the men had left. That's when she went to confirm Abe's killing and then find William, who was alive and as safe as he could be given what happened. Eliza and the children lost Abe, their cash, all their possessions that year's crop, their hogs, and most of Abe's tools. Their home had been destroyed and the men's knowledge that they left an adult witness meant that it wasn't safe for the, stamp, for the family to remain on their homestead. Eliza reported what happened to local authorities. A grand jury was convened to investigate the spate of attacks. She was one of, her family was one of several hit in the community that night. But many of the witnesses were too afraid to talk. Initially, it's clear Eliza was ready to testify. She was ready to go through the process. It's not clear who or what spooked her, but she and the children shot out of Choctaw County. En route, she heard and learned that Abe's killers were, uh, were pursuing them, but she and the children were able to pick up pace, pick up their pace, and they made it to Demopolis, where she thought they might be safe. Targeted people's reports of atrocities to the Freedmen's Bureau, Army personnel, local, state, and federal authorities were like these urgent dispatches from the front lines of the war on Reconstruction. Receiving a flood of reports of attacks like the one on Eliza's family, the U.S. Congress convened an investigation into, quote, the execution of laws and the safety of the lives and the property of the citizens of the United States. The committee's work became known as the Klan hearings because of how prominently violence, like the visits, featured in the investigation. Lawmakers traveled to these hot spots of Southern disorder where they solicited testimony from office holders, voters, accused perpetrators, and their victims. Families like Abe and Eliza had greeted emancipation with great expectations. Many of them had managed to achieve their dreams of freedom or were on their way to doing so when the white men came for them. When Congress issued the call for witnesses, they stepped forward, hoping to convince federal officials to take purposeful action to end the violence so their families could live in peace, pursue their dreams, and secure their children's futures. Eliza Lyon, whose testimony, a clip of it you can see here, now a widow, lost everything. Displaced from her home community and support network, she was struggling to care for herself and her children in Demopolis. Whatever progress her family had made, they lost. And this was exactly what the white men waging war on black people's freedom intended, to destroy everything black people had built after slavery and leave them with nothing. Maybe with the hope that that would force them to return to the plantations. Facing the prospect that the world wouldn't know what white extremists did to them, that there might not be some form of redress, survivors like Eliza stepped forward at great risk to themselves and their families and reported what happened to authorities. And if that didn't pan out, they went up the chain of command to the Freedmen's Bureau and the U.S. Army. They shared their stories with governors and other office holders, with the press and even members of Congress. And as they told their stories, they revealed not only that they were attacked, 
but how much they had gained with freedom, everything that they had built, and what they were losing to the white Southern War against it. Brave survivors and witnesses like Alexander K. Davis, who testified about violence in and around Macon, Mississippi, made their way to the hearing sites by foot, train, boat, and wagon, carrying the stories of violent attacks as extremists made clear their determination to sustain as much of slavery as possible. Enslavers had released black people from bondage, but we see from who, when, why, where, and how they attacked that they didn't believe that black people had the right to their children, to choose their sexual partners, to education, to free religious lives, to labor autonomy, to homes, land, businesses, capital, and political power to protect all these rights. And if it sounds a lot like slavery, that's what they had in mind. Eliza and other survivors and witnesses' decision to testify was informed by their individual and collective sense of self-love and self-respect. Their accounts provide a counter-narrative to the stories we've been told about Reconstruction just failing. Speaking with one voice, survivors said white Southerners were waging war on Reconstruction by attacking black people who were making the most of freedom. Isaac Steer used the word disastered to describe what he observed white men do to families they visited. And disasters are these extraordinary, in the words of one sociologist, unmanageable, unexpected, unfortunate, unplanned, unevents in the extreme. And I think Steer's use of disaster as a verb, the catalog of fatal and life-altering injuries, and survivors' tuition that they would never get over what happened, illustrate black people's clear-eyed understanding of the totalizing nature of Klan violence. In naming their attackers, in detailing their injuries, in saying the names of their slain kin, crying out for justice, and keeping a record of, of trying to keep a record of what happened alive, survivors like Eliza Lyon said that black people's lives, freedoms, and futures mattered. <clears throat> Testifying before Congress about what happened was their best defense against the, uh, against the erasure of this violence. And what we know is that their testimonies before Congress will help drive the federal investigation that drives the Klan underground. But not before the Klan had seriously undercut black people's freedom and participation in American democracy. After Confederates overthrow Reconstruction and boarded up the Temple of Liberty, they crafted the big lie that the experiment in American democracy had failed. They falsely claimed that white Northerners had unfairly punished white Southerners for secession by enacting, quote, black rule. Black men voted and were voted into office, but they had never enacted any policies that took away white people's civil or political rights. But none of that mattered to the Confederates and their supporters who were determined to deprive black people of any opportunity to transcend slavery. So they falsely claimed that emancipation, equal rights, and the franchise were wasted on black people. And these claims were part of a larger white supremacist political project to deny black people dignity and even life in freedom. With black people supposedly not knowing their place, white extremists claimed that they simply had no choice but to restore their honor. And the only way they could do that was by forming white terror gangs, raping, torturing, murdering, and massacring black people, and then installing the racist apartheid system of Jim Crow and they flood the public spheres with this propaganda. And so what we see is that black Southerners counter histories of atrocity and betrayal were no match for the machinery of the lost cause and all the Americans who embraced the big lie of Reconstruction's supposed failure. Now, inevitably, someone will ask me about the, quote, good white people. Weren't there white, some white Southerners who weren't extremists? Weren't there times when black and white people worked together? Sure. But not enough to stop the slaughter and dispossession of thousands, to make sure that known perpetrators were caught, to avert lynching, white rampages and massacres, or to prevent Jim Crow from being installed. 
And I saw death coming. I used testimonies like Eliza's to challenge this failure narrative of Reconstruction by highlighting the story of African Americans who, as Attica Locke put it, leapt from the frying pan of slavery into the fires of freedom. Historians have known about these records and have used them to establish the fact of election violence. But I think they reveal so much more than that. African Americans' articulations of the human cost of this violence have been sitting in the historical record for more than a century. These records, I think, should persuade us to reconsider the single stories we've been telling about Reconstruction violence and who and what these convenient narratives of Reconstruction just failing serve. I think that when we teach and write about this history, uh, we need to do it in the active voice, not in the passive voice, and be more explicit at every turn about who failed to do what and why. And I do that because what black people targeted in the war after the Civil War knew and tried to communicate to anyone who would listen was that families were the cornerstone of black liberation. Kinship was the glue that had bound black people together during slavery and carried them into freedom. Voting, office holding, and equal rights were a means to a future in which black families would be secure. And that's why Confederates struck at the very heart of black people's freedom when they overthrew Reconstruction. Disasters like the ones these families endured didn't have conclusions, which is why targeted people, including voters and office holders, often spent so much time in their testimonies talking about not just being disfranchised, but, what about, but about what happened to their families during these attacks. For many survivors, the task ahead was to remember the future, to hold tightly to their people and their deferred dreams, while moving forward towards an uncertain horizon. I think that understanding black family stories of racing into freedom and the price white extremists made them pay in the war against it, Americans learned that the arc of our history doesn't always bend toward justice. This story, I think, is essential for understanding why, more than a century and a half later, our struggle continues. Thank you.